Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here today to talk about Surface, Higgs, and I'm going to start with the motivation uh, behind both of those uh, pieces of software. So we're going to start with the motivation so we can go uh, through the, some of the conceptual difference between them. And uh, finally, we're going to try to have a glimpse into the future to see what we, you could expect from those uh, technologies. So about motivation, um, when I started to work with Phoenix, I was amazed by the technology. Uh, I was pretty impressive how easy it was to create those rich, highly uh, interactive applications. Uh, but there was a couple of things that I was kind of frustrated when I started. And for me, some of the things that were missing in the, at the beginning, when I was started to use LiveView, was first of all, we had a very limited uh, stateless component API. I mean, the first thing, when you talk about component, like two years ago, it was the LiveView function. And the live view function uh, did not work on state with stateless components. So if you try to use a component that you created, if you try to use it in a layout or a controller-based view, you are not able to use those components. So this was like the first limitation I saw. Uh, the second one was that there was no uh, HTML component aware template engine. So this was really uh, maybe the, the, the main flaw I could saw at that point. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go through each one of them uh, in a minute. So, and the last one is the lack of declarative API for components. So those are like three main things that I was missing in live view. So limited stateless component API as I told you, was we couldn't use those components uh, in controller-based views, nor layouts. Uh, the second one, which is uh, there was no HTML component aware template engine. So it didn't make, uh, Hicks is, uh, EX is really great. It's really uh, fast. And the problem is that it didn't make any uh, distinction between plain text and a structured format like HTML. And if you're trying to create a component model, uh, there's no way you can get around that without uh, actually having uh, a language that, that can actually uh, understand uh, the structure of the HTML. So with EX, uh, any important information that we had in all that structured HTML structure were completely ignored. So it was really easy to create uh, invalid a, uh, HTML, and that works pretty bad if you're trying to, especially with Live View, when you try to map uh, the state that is on the client on the server. So you really need to have uh, a validated structure. Uh, one example, I mean, I remember many times people getting crazy when they just forget to close a div, and Live View just started to to, to co be, get completely messy, updating things that are not supposed to be. And there was no warning or error uh, whatsoever. So the third one, the, the third missing part was uh, the lack of declarative API. So when we talk about components, uh, components are building blocks. And it's hard to get those building blocks together if you don't know the, their public interface. So if you want to work a component, it's important to actually know the shape of those components, so you can put them together. So without the declarative API, which is the last one, you need to ask yourself all those questions. I mean, I remember whenever I was in a, in a live view uh, template, I saw all those assigns, and then I had to always ask those questions, especially if it was a component that was not uh, designed <laughs> Uh, by me, so it was somebody else, so I had no idea what, what was going on in the component. So I need to answer those questions. So which assigns are public and should be passed as uh, arguments? Uh, and which of them are, are private? I mean, which assigns 
maybe it's manipulated by handle events. So maybe it's initialized on mount. So we have these two kind of values you interact with live components. Some of them come externally from the client for the caller, and some of them are internal. So we need to ask all those questions when I saw the assigns, and I, sh I should keep going, scrolling uh, up and down to find answers about it. So another question was, uh, what's the type of that assign? I mean, if you don't document that, it was really hard to find out. We really need to run and see what's going on. Uh, there was also, without the declarative API, you just don't know which assigns are actually required. So you can just take a look at the, the template you see using that assign, but you don't know if there's any treatment, if that assign is new or not. So it's hard to, to know by just looking at it if you need to pass that assign from the caller. And the last one, which was uh, which assigns was representing the, the state of the component, as I said, like the private state, and I should not pass this as uh, an attribute or an argument. So this was the motivation to create Surface about a couple of years ago, about two and a half years ago. And this was the, the, the motivation was to create this, this component model for Phoenix Live View. And the focus was to improve ergonomics. Like it's, it's really the main focus of Surface. And this is what it did. I mean, it's pretty, uh, the way we, we tried to do this was to create this, this model, which is pretty common, it's similar to React in, in, I mean, in, in terms of syntax. You can just use your components as markup. So pretty much as what we have uh, in most of those template uh, languages. Uh, having done this, I said, uh, this component aware template engine we were able to, to tackle the first problem was, that was to validate the structure of the HTML. So with this one, uh, after we create the, the parser, we were able to, to provide uh, instant compile time messages. If something just went wrong, if something was wrong with the structure, we were able to have a compile time uh, message. Uh, the declarative API we also introduced in Surface. So now there's a, there, there was a, a way to actually, okay, there's a, those are the properties. This is things that you should pass as attributes to the component. Uh, you could define if this property is required. If it's required and you don't pass it, it will raise a compile time error. So all of these things completely changed the way I was using those templates because now I don't have to answer all those questions myself. They are all there in a declarative way. And if for some reason I mess something, uh, the compiler will help me to find a problem. So another thing we, we did was to have a clear separation about the public and the private data. So if something is a prop or a slot, it should be passed by the caller. So and if something is declared as data, that means it's internal state, so you should never pass this as attributes. So some of the benefits of having this model is that we've seen before that we had static validation for the syntax, but from the moment you add this, uh, that you combine this with the declarative API, then you can start crossing this information, the information, the validated information about the structure and the, the information you can introspect from the components. You can cross the information and now you can provide semantic uh, validation. So if I define uh, my list of properties, which should be passed as attributes, and I try to pass an attribute that doesn't exist, the compiler will uh, tell me that, that there's no such uh, property. So other benefits is uh, introspecting the information from the component, so you can generate documentation automatically. M a bunch of tools you can create when you are able to automatically introspect information about those components. Uh, there are also many other features that, w that you can 
uh, add to the ecosystem when you have that information, when you have those features, which is precise formatters. I mean, uh, formatters for Surface that we have since the first version, and it was extremely easy to do it. And if you've been f using uh, Phoenix for a while, you know that formatters has been a pain for years. And we could only solve this issue with Higgs. So it shows the, the, the power of the component model, and that's why I miss that so much. We also can provide autocomplete suggestions for editors, uh, converters. Uh, when we change the syntax between version 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, we didn't ask our, uh, the, the users to manually change everything. So we just create a converter, and they could automatically run the converter, and everything would be updated automatically, because, because, because we knew the structure of the template. So it's easy to do these kind of things. And another tool that we uh, developed as an experiment was the Surface Catalog, uh, which is an attempt for us to get something similar to, uh, to Storybook uh, in the JS uh, world. So if you, have, if you set up the catalog for your project, you're going to automatically have the list of components. And that list of components, if you click on a component, you can have examples, you can have a playground, when you can actually interact with the component, you can change properties and see how the component behave. You can see a log of the information of the events. So it's uh, still a, lot of w uh, a long way to go uh, to make it really complete, but it's a really, uh, a, a really cool thing that we have and we use a lot uh, for development, especially because when, when you're trying to develop a component and that component it's like, it, it, it takes a while for you using the application to set up the state of the component. Sometimes you need to click on a bunch of buttons, navigate to get there. In the catalog, you just set up this minimal uh, state, and then you can use it. It's much faster. Uh, there are also some other features. This was like extra things we did. I mean, like, n not much related with the, like, the three main flaws I uh, I had with, with Live View, but uh, I thought there are some uh, things that we should do in order to get even better development experience. So context, for instance, is uh, if you ever work with React, you're probably aware of the of that. You're familiar with that uh, concept. So one problem you have in React and other component-based. Uh, uh, template languages is the prop drilling. Sometimes you have a property in a component and then you need to pass that property and the component gets that property and has to pass to the ch to its children and then the children pass to the other children. So it's really a pain uh, to, to do this. It gets really variables as you can see. In the top you can see prop drilling in action. So if you click in that component and you can go to the code, it's going to pass that property forward to the to the underlying uh, text input call. And with context, you can actually tell the, f the, the component to say, look, keep this in the context. And any of the children that declare they want to use that value, they're going to be able to get it automatically. So I don't recommend this for everything. You shouldn't get crazy. If you work with React, you know this is not for every single uh, to, to do in every single uh, case, but it's really helpful for things like form, and especially when you have this uh, very specific uh, scope. I, I wouldn't recommend using this in a very large scope and you pass a lot of information to all the children, but it's really handy for things like form. Another feature you have is uh, collocated JS hooks. Uh, if you ever w w work with JS hooks, uh, every time you create a hook, you need to go to the uh, app JS and add that hook to the list of hooks. Uh, with Surface, you just have to create a collocated file, create a hook, and then you just have to reference that hook. You don't even need to go to the app JS. So it's really, I hate to have those uh, code that belongs to one component uh, in different places. I love to have everything that belongs to the component 
uh, collocated. And one last thing we, we created recently uh, was the, the mix uh, surface init task, which is a task that creates a bunch of patches in all the, the, the files that needs to be changed to set up a surface. So if you run the, the if you if you create a, a new Phoenix app with Phoenix new, and then you run, you, you add surface as dependency and you run that task, it's just going to patch all the files it requires to, to set up a surface. And one cool thing about the, that task is that in case you have already changed the file, or maybe because it's already patched, you, you've run already the task, or maybe you manually changed something, uh, the task will not try to duplicate the patch and you actually tell the message that, okay, I, I could not uh, apply this patch. Maybe you have already applied it or maybe you changed something because when you're patching uh, files that are actually Elixir code, you can actually change that code completely. You can create variables, you can call from other functions. So if, if, if the, 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 the task cannot apply a patch, it's going to list everything and tell how you can apply it uh, manually. And the idea the, uh, of this uh, API is that people creating uh, suites of components using Surface, they can actually use the same strategy. They can create their own init task based on the same API so they can do their own uh, setups. So, uh, one thing that we find uh, after those two and a half years working uh, with Surface was that uh, at, some, at, at some point we kind of uh, hit the wall and it was really hard to, to, to keep evolving Surface because there was no component model in LiveView and sometimes you need to do things that were already implemented in LiveView, but was private, uh, was not even accessible, was private API. And sometimes there was some private API that we could use, but we should have been using. So this was really frustrating. And I mean, the fact that some of the important, uh, some of the important features in Surface, like slots and contents, what was, was were, they were constantly, uh, interfering with the diff tracking because diff tracking is something done uh, under the hood in LiveView. There's no public library, so we cannot interfere there directly. But when we try to use, uh, try to implement a feature and there's no support in LiveView, you're usually gonna mess things with diff tracking. And this was like a crucial, crucial moment uh, for the project. And we, th that was when we realized that uh, we needed to bring surface features to live view. I mean, either we bring these features to live view, or at some point we are not going to be able to maintain surface anymore because we are always being those new features from scratch, and then whenever they change something in live view, everything breaks again. So uh, we realize when you start to, do, okay, we, let's try to, to bring those, fun, to, those functionalities to, to live view. And the first problem was like, uh, before you can do anything, uh, we needed to build uh, an HTML component uh, template for live view. Uh, the problem is if I want to bring those concepts to live view itself, I cannot bring surface as a whole a lot of features that doesn't belong to the scope of a, a, a live view core. So how am, I, how am I supposed to test those functionalities if I don't have uh, a template language, a building template language? So we needed to validate the structure. The, the, we need to have at least something that can validate the structure so we can also keep the diff tracking optimizations. And that's how Higgs was born. So that necessity, to bring those features to, to live view was the, the real motivation behind Higgs. So I'm gonna get back to Higgs in a moment, but this, this is just a list of the contributions we have uh, for live view. So Higgs itself, uh, the API for stateless components, that's what actually makes 
function components work is the component uh, function. Uh, is the slots API, even the syntax highlighting for VS Code were all contributions from uh, the Surface team. So we really engaged in, in, in this project. It might be confusing for someone. People sometimes uh, ask me, so you work, you, you create a Surface and then you create a Higgs as well. So what is the point? And that's what I'm trying to, to clarify here. So the last piece of the, the, the things we wanted to contribute is the declarative API for component. This is like the, the, the last thing we need to do to consolidate the model. So all of the other things, it's already there. So this is, I think this is kind of the most important thing I'm going to do in this talk, which is show the conceptual difference between, between each one of them and why we need to have both. Uh, so the first one, it's, uh, it, it, uh, Hicks is a building template language. So if you're a minimalist and you don't want any dependency, uh, extra dependency in your project, uh, that's not even a, a, a question to ask. I mean, go for Hicks because it's already there. Uh, another difference uh, is that Surface has its own AST. So after we parse the whole template, we get all this information in AST, and Higgs doesn't. Higgs automatically parses things and calls the, the EX engine underneath. We have a extra step, which is defining the AST. And by defining the AST, it also uh, allows us to have some extra features that I think it's really awesome. One of them is macro components. So macro components are very similar to macro in Elixir. Uh, so you can, s I hope you can see there. You have HTML code and then some components there. And then you have a markdown component. And the markdown component, the content, what we have in the bottom of this component, it's actual markdown code. And if you try to do this in uh, Higgs or even in Surface without a macro component, uh, the parser will try, it will consider this as HTML because that's what Higgs and Surface is, They're, they extend HTML. And this is not going to work because when you go through the Higgs engine, the underlying Higgs engine, it's going to evaluate this code here. So you will try to show this div and you're going to get uh, something completely unexpected. So with Markdown, with macro components, you, you, can, you have a callback, then when the compiler finds a macro component, it says, okay, I'm not going to evaluate this. Take the body of this uh, macro component, take the attributes, do whatever you want, and return me the AST. So you can get that code, the raw markdown, then you can call earmark, you can generate the HTML, you can use syntax highlighting and everything will just work. And another cool thing about this, this is all done at compile time. So this is all going to be really optimized uh, by the GIF tracker because the GIF tracker will consider everything as static. And there's no extra cost uh, at runtime. Uh, another macro component we use in the website, for instance, is this one, which is the, the one that shows examples. So for each component, I, for this case, a form. And I want to actually uh, evaluate the form so I can see the form and I can play around. But I also want to see the code of the form. So usually, if you don't have macro components, you need to probably copy paste that code. In a, every time you change the code here, you need to change the code there. But since you have a macro component, you can actually place this code only once. And inside the macro components, he's, he's, the component has the power to do anything with the content. We can get that text, put it in one div, which is to show the, the, the code highlighted. And then you can get that code, call the compiler, get the AST, and then generate another AST, including both of them. So micro components are great if you need to do compile time manipulation of the AST, just like in Elixir. 
if you want to do some static validation of the body of the content, you have also you can do this with micro components. You can embed other languages as we did with Markdown, and you can do also optimizations. If you have a micro component and all the properties, for instance, you pass are literals, you can actually generate exact code that you need at runtime. So we don't need to pass that at runtime. It's going to be much faster. Uh, the last two items, they need to be uh, discussed uh, together because they're kind of the same thing. So surface uh, Higgs, from the beginning, uh, it's focused on compatibility with EX. And Surface, from day one, it's the focus is extensibility. So we don't care about EX, the syntax of EX, because we are not, uh, we're not the same project. We don't have that constraint. But for Higgs, it's different. We needed to keep it as simple as possible because it's going to be in the, at the core. So those two items you can explain, trying to, uh, the different uh, templating strategies. So like the first, uh, the first code there, you, you can see that uh, it's a hex code, which is the same as EX in this case. And at the bottom, you can see the surface code. And the main difference, which is important, and it's going to change completely the way you, you're going to extend the language, is that on the top, you can see that the four uh, comprehension belongs to Elixir. So that doesn't belong to the template language. Actually, Higgs, not even sure if it can be considered a template language because actually it's just a way to interpolate code with Elixir. So in Surface, you can see it's different. The only thing that it's Elixir there is the expression there for the for. So that brings some implications. Uh, in Higgs or e EX, uh, this is very common code you have in many templates, in many views, which is you're going through a list showing the, the items of the list. And if the list is empty, you're just going to show that there is no item. So it's a very common case. Uh, it's not that common uh, in Elixir because as a function, functional uh, programming language, language the for comprehension usually transforms data, so it's okay to get an array, an empty array, because usually you're just gonna keep uh, sending that value forward in the pipeline. But in this case, this is the view, so we have side effects. If you have an empty list, usually you're gonna tell the user that the list is empty. So in Surface, since the for doesn't belong to Elixir, we can extend the for, and then you can create the for else construct, which you cannot do in Elixir. So this is the kind of things that probably like the main difference between them. So Higgs tries to be compatible for EX, so it maximizes everything in Elixir, which is a, which is a general, general purpose language, not a DSL. It's not, it, it was not meant to be used in views. In views, you can see in every other technology, that we usually try to do things more specific uh, for the view. So this is just an example. This is another example you can use if, else. I mean, it's a different language. Now, this is actually a templating language. We have constructs. We have a way to loop through lists. You have a way to do conditionals. And it's completely separated from, from, from Elixir. So what we can do in the future, we can add modifiers to those constructs. We can. We, we already have modifiers for the directives. So if you want to, you can actually extend and create some other uh, modifiers. So you don't have to, maybe if empty, so the empty could work with empty list, it could work with empty string, it could work with new. So you don't have to repeat all of that. This is not done, but it's, this is just to demonstrate things that we might do in the future, since it, they are separate. Uh, another thing we have is the way to extend the, to enhance an, an expression. So in Higgs, everything inside the attributes area, if you put it in a curly brackets, it has to be total valid uh, Elixir expression. And in our case, we have the concept of tagged expression with, with uh, extensibility in mind. So even expressions, we can have uh, a tag 
which is like a token after the curly, which is also common in some other templating languages. So we can actually change, we can enhance, we can change the meaning of the expression. So as you can see there, you have style, it's pretty much the same as Higgs. And then the class, you can have uh, tagged expression, which would be equivalent to class equals class. And we have the other uh, tagged expression with the three dots, which it's similar to the spread operated in, in JavaScript. So we can keep going with, with this, like extending the, la the, the template language. And you can use, for instance, this tag expression to generate the get test call. So we can have this as uh, for internationalization. And there are many things that we have ideas and uh, because we, we can do this, we're able to do this. So the benefits of have this tail made uh, template language, uh, it's because we can focus basically on ergonomics. Keep in mind that uh, Higgs, it's the minimum we can do to make it work, to bring all the other features. It's gonna be hard to get Higgs in the same direction because we, we need to, if you want to do things like this, you, you're actually gonna need to change Elixir itself, which I don't think is gonna happen. And we can also be more friendly uh, to new users. Um, we can avoid common pitfalls when using this general purpose language. There are, sometimes you think that you can do, because you're using Elixir inside Higgs, you can do everything, but you cannot. There's a lot of, bunch of restrictions. So you're kind of already using something that is not uh, Elixir. You cannot use pipe between those pieces of code. You cannot uh, use uh, anonymous functions and have blocks inside. Um, you, cannot, you, you cannot create aliases. There's a, a bunch of restrictions uh, wh when you're using. So if you have the, your own template language, you can really extend it the way you want. And most importantly, it can evolve independent and without forcing changes in Elixir. Uh, if you take a look at the, 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 <coughs> the commit history of Elixir, there's, you're gonna find a bunch of commits related to the formatter. So this shows how coupled is uh, Higgs with Elixir itself. So some of the things that in the new formatter still need changes in Elixir to work. So they are not uh, uh, independent. So this is nice because you get everything there already, but it's going to restrict the way you can extend uh, the language. So um, the next thing for the Surface team, it's to unify the declarative API, which is the last step. So another thing is going to minimize component compile time dependencies. When, we, when, we, when you started with Surface, there was no support in, in Live View for anything like that. So the way we, we, we found to make things like slots work was to actually, depending on the component, so we can get information about the slots. So this is not a, a thing anymore since we have slots in the core now. Uh, there are some other ideas we have to support also collocated uh, uh, CSS files for scope the styles, like similar as we, we did for the JS hooks. And we're gonna add some more options to the surface init task, something like uh, init, uh, Tailwind or other, other things that you can do. Uh, and this is the PR uh, we are cur currently uh, working on, which is going to unify the declarative API. So Surface will use this. And then this is the last thing we need to do to actually consolidate the model. And once the, the model is consolidated, you're gonna, you're gonna have a choice to use whatever template language you want because if you create a suite of components using Higgs, you can use it in Surface, and if you create one in Surface, you're gonna be able to use it with Higgs. So this is our, our main goal. So it's, uh, it's established Phoenix as a great foundation for writing components, regardless of the template language, the, the template engine. I, I think this is really crucial, and it's ambitious, but I think we are almost there. So as soon as you have the declarative API, we're gonna be able to remove a bunch of code from Surface, just use the, the public API, and we're gonna be able to use things like the catalog for any component. 
So this is what I have for you uh, today. I think that my main mission here is trying to explain um, why we need both of them. Uh, two and a half years ago, I, I, I thought this would be a good idea. I, I was at Glixiconf, uh, I showed the, the, the prototype to Josiah and Chris, they loved it, and they said to me, this will never make it to, to Live View Core, never, so go on. And then I did, and kind of two years later, he said, oh, come on, we need this. Can you bring back to Live View? Yeah, sure, I can. <laughs> and then it's like sometimes it's, it's uh, complicated because some of the features I had to implement three times in Surface, the first time, and then in, in Higgs, and then I need to change everything I did to use the new API. But um, I think this is, this is what is important. I mean, we, we are converging the basic model, and each of those languages are going to go in their own direction, given those conceptual differences. I mean, one is going to try to keep compatibility with VX, and I try to show you that that imposes limitations to when it comes to ergonomics, how you can evolve the language to get more synthetic sugar uh, on the template side. And Surface can go its own way exploring those. Since like we've, doing, we've been doing this for uh, two years and a half, we've been exploring those new ideas, which would be impossible to explore if you were uh, doing this in Live View Core. So that's what I have for you. And last thing, I want to thank uh, SimpleBat because uh, it's sponsoring my work for Surface and Live View. So I really appreciate when a company do this. And we need more company investing in open source so we can turn those ideas in something useful. Thank you.